Okay, hi everyone. I think we're ready to get started. So, um, again, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Jazz and I work in the marketing department here at Business Systems. For those of you who don't know, um, here at Business Systems, we've been helping contact centers optimize their operations and workforce for almost 30 years. Um, this particular webinar comes on the back of our third annual survey on the state of quality monitoring, which was conducted in partnership with the forum, who are also here with us today. Today we'll be talking about how to bring quality monitoring into the heart of the contact center and we'll be joined by our very own quality management consultant and training specialist Brent Bishop. Hi Brent. Quality monitoring business consultant Marcus Levitt from our good partners Nice Systems and last but not least Chris Rainsport, community development manager, manager from the forum. Before we get started, just a little quick housekeeping rules. You've all been muted, but please do feel free to ask questions on the control panel. We are going to have time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar, and we'll try and answer all of your questions then. Um, for those of you who won't get time, we will get back to you after. So without further ado, Brent, over to you. Thank you, Dad. OK, let me just share my screen. Okay, I hope that's coming through okay and everyone can see that, okay. Um, well, thank you everyone. Thank you for allowing uh, me to speak today. Um, as uh, Jazz mentioned, Business Systems conducted a survey recently with the forum um, on the state of quality monitoring and the report will be released next week. Um, but what I wanted to do today was just share some of the highlights with you um, and some of the findings that we had from that, from that report that we've done. Just to kind of give you an idea of the, the types of industries that we've surveyed, we took a really good broad cross spectrum of um, contact centers and good mixture of contact center sizes as well. Um, so we've got, got, got quite a good sample of um, um, contact centers across the business. Before we go into the survey results though, what I want to just kind of bring this up is the performance cycle for QM. I think most people have probably seen something like this in the past. This is typically the process that we would follow for successful quality monitoring in any contact center. And it would typically start with at the top, we do some kind of analysis or evaluation of interactions, our customer interactions. We evaluate those calls or emails. And then we would go into data analysis where we do some kind of reporting um, for the agent or for the, um, the operations area of the business. We would then move into business and, and coaching improvement where we would look at um, obviously coaching those agents, developing them, looking at what, how we can improve the overall operational area. Finally, we benchmark and refine that process and then we repeat that process cycle over and over again. And I think most people probably on this, on this webinar would have seen something like this before. And to make this work, we obviously need to focus on having good processes and documentation. That's key for that. So good guidelines um, and processes on how that works within the contact center. We need the correct tools and software. So, you know, if we're using QM software, we're using call recording, maybe using speech analytics, there's a whole raft of tools out there now that actually make the job a lot easier for you. You need the right training in place, of course, and that's not only training the agents on, on quality monitoring, but obviously um, looking at your team leaders, team managers, operations, etc., QM. And the last two there, having the right commitment and drive and the time, and these are probably the two biggest ones, really. Having that commitment from the top down right to the organization that quality is a really important and integral part of the business, but also finding the time to do it. It is a time consuming process. Um, so the reason I kind of bring this up is when we start looking at some of the kind of survey results, I'd like everyone to think about relating this back to this process and how what these survey results are telling us and how this would affect this particular process itself. So the first question we asked um, is, how do customers contact your contact center? And no surprise here, obviously most people are doing telephone conversations, it's, it's almost 100% there. But we're seeing a massive increase in email and web chat and a decrease in letters. So we have a lot more customer contact points now within any kind of contact center um, that customers can reach us. But the interesting graph is the next one there. We asked them, um, how do you, which particular contacts do you evaluate? 
uh, once again, we saw that everyone's evaluating telephones, but less than 50% are actually evaluating emails and web chats. And this was quite a surprising um, figure for myself that we're still focusing heavily on, on telephones, but we're not looking at a lot of these new media. And we'll come back to this one um, a little bit later and look at this one in a bit, bit more detail. The next one we looked at was what tools do they currently use for QM? And once again now we're seeing call recording is very much a stable within today's contact centers. It was used a lot and obviously it makes sense to use that for quality monitoring. However, we're still seeing a big chunk of contact centers using manual evaluation forms and that's still at 38% and that's using things like um, Excel, Microsoft Word, those kinds of things. And only 40% are using quality monitoring software. Now, considering that QM software has been around for over 25 years now, there's been kind of a slow uptake in, in investing in that. And I can only assume that there's a slow reason for that is, is that because people see that as a massive cost to the business, and a cost to the contact center and not a benefit to the business. We're also seeing quite a small percentage now using speech analytics, which is moving in the right direction. Um, because speech analytics can be a huge, massive, um, improvement for the business to actually nail down those particular calls that you're looking for, um, but still that's a very slow um, uptake in the industry. How does that compare to last year though? Well, it is getting better. So for example, the manual forms have decreased from 48% down to 38%, and we have seen an increase um, from 33 to 40% on the QM software. Um, Christy, what, what do you feel about this? Do you, have you seen much change from your end? Uh, yeah, I think the, the the survey does give us a um, a view of, of of how the industry is moving. I think where we do see some change happening is that some of the QM software, where people are advancing on some of their manual forms or their monitoring processes, the software that's available to them in some cases doesn't give them the same thing. So they're happy with their approach to how they're evaluating or their evaluation process, but the software that's available to them, they cannot kind of import that in so they've got to change their process so that makes things a little bit more difficult for people so they're a little bit wary of then investing down the software route if they've got to change their whole approach to quality um, which is not necessarily true it's just a perception so there's a bit of work to do there and to your point before around it, it people seeing it as a cost um, and a driver of cost in the business um, generally we find that the people see it as a cost because it's not an embedded process or it's not a process that's engaged with um, and it's already adding cost to the business in terms of resource etc so they don't want to add any additional cost in yet until they start seeing the benefit so there's a bit of work to do there um, but the, the survey is positive in a way that we're seeing it we're seeing a shift um, but there's still some work to do within the industry yeah, definitely. Cheers. Thank you very much, and um, so one of the next things we looked at is how effective are these tools in driving success? So if people have made that investment. Now we asked this across all the tools, but I just wanted, for this particular presentation, just wanted to focus on these two, because my guess is the majority of people would be using one, one or either of these approaches. So we looked at manual forms and we looked at the QM software. What I thought was interesting here is, is that even with QM software, 15% of contact centers are saying that that's very effective. So there's still a huge room for improvement. So people are making that investment in the QM software, but they're not seeing those full benefits that they were hoping for. And we, you can see that we've just got over 50% that are saying that the software is effective. It's, yes, it's, uh, compared to manual forms, it's probably a huge improvement to what they're doing, but it's still a lot more that they could be doing it, which is a good thing that people are recognizing now that, that yes, it works, but they could do better and there's a lot more they can do with it. It's just taking that time and commitment to make those changes. We asked them what areas they could improve. Once again, the big thing that kind of threw me out here was that only 16% are actually saying everything is okay. And that's actually good, because people can see that this, this, this process is required. It's definitely, quality monitoring is an important process within the call center or the contact center. Um, and they can actually see that this is a useful tool or useful process to have, but it's not working and there's things that they can improve on. And the, the areas there that they're bringing up, I think probably most people can relate to. So looking at no guidelines or lack of process, lack of commitment to the process, lack of training, 
Uh, maybe your QM software is out of date or has lacks of functionality, which kind of Chris was just mentioning about changing your QM process to fit within the software. Maybe that people prefer it to be the other way around, have the software fit to their process and be better. So lack of functionality becomes a big thing. And a really important one there, lack of effective reporting data. Um, and that's a key one. I'm going to come back to it a little bit later in, in, this, in, in this presentation because that's quite an important one. If you can't get your information out of your system, then really what's the point of doing the process? One of the next questions we asked was, who actually gets QM training? So you think that'd be pretty obvious. And this, out of all the graphs I've got today, this is probably the biggest surprise for me in terms of someone that's come from a quality monitoring and training background. You know, we're talking some of these here are only 50% or less. And these are actually specific QM training programs within the contact centre are dedicated to, to train us on how to do QM. And it amazing that we're, we're training just over 50% of our agents on the QM process. And even the QM team there, you can see that's just there 49%. We're not even training our QM teams on actually how to do their job, and that's quite a big concern. And no one really starts in a contact center being an expert in quality monitoring in a way, or how to be an effective coach, or how to do evaluate calls. It's a skill that needs to be learned and taught, and that's got to come from the business itself. It's got to come from the contact center. Um, and that's really important. Um, uh, Chris, I'd be interested to get your viewpoint on this and what you feel about the training side of things. It's quite worrying, isn't it? So I, I, I can look at this and go, you know, as we, if we're trying to change the perception of our quality monitoring programs um, and what our what our desired outcome is and, and why we're doing something, if we're not investing the time in the people that essentially can influence that um, and and get the buy-in and the engagement into the process, into the the policy, the procedure that sits around QM and and why we're doing it, then we're going to struggle to make it successful, we're going to struggle to get people to, to really buy into it and we're going to struggle to improve our service offering as we move forward. I think you know it is a, it is a real big worry that there's an, that we just expect that people will understand it um, and just expect that people can get on with it. Um, it you know I think there's, there's there's massive work to do there in terms of changing the perception of it uh, and, and it should be the thing that we invest heavily in if we're, if we're putting our time, effort and, and money and resources into a process, everyone should be bought into it from from the top down, and you know, not even just that group of people there, but the the senior leadership teams within your contact centres need to understand what the purpose of the QM program is, what are they trying to do, get out of it, and how it works, what it does for us as a business, etc. You know, you're never going to make a shift in your business if you're only training half of your people, um, or only half of the organisations are training people. It's just a it's just a worry. Yeah, definitely. And that comes back to that point that you were saying there about commitment because, um, you know, how can you expect people to be committed to the process and actually, you know, um, focus on that task that they need to do if, if there's no drive from it from, the, from day one when you're training people on how to do the job? Yeah, especially so it's really if it, important that you know, Especially yeah, if it okay. sits as part, especially if it sits as part of their development program. So if they're managed on it, or you know, it's part of their KPI set, or it's anything like that. If they're not kind of shown how to influence it or how to do differently collectively, then they're never going to get there. Um, it's just you know, it just it just doesn't it doesn't. If if we're going to say it's important to them to do something well. And it's important to their career progression. It's important to them in terms of their bonus or whatever it might be. But then we don't invest in the training of those people. How do they then see it as important? If we don't make it important as a business, then how are they going to see it as being an important part of their role? Um, and you know that that's what we need to invest in. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then the last graph I wanted to share with you, then we're going to kind of review some of the data. Is um, we asked the question: Is QM aligned? to other business areas or which business areas of the business. And not surprisingly, the majority are saying it's aligned to customer service satisfaction strategy. And that would make sense. Quality monitoring is a very operational focused process. And that's its purpose, to improve customer satisfaction, improve sales, improve retention, et cetera. What does surprise me here is that people don't recognize it as an overall business strategy. It's just seen as it is just something that operations do and not something that regarded across the whole of the business. Um, likewise, they're not seeing it as a useful process that kind of that fits into HR, into recruitment, into the training process, into the IT process, into your marketing um, marketing departments. 
So quality is more just about do the agents do the right job. It's valuable information that it can give you and it can feed back into a lot of these different business areas. You know, if you relate um, quality to under, other industries, um, so car manufacturing, for example, you know, that quality control process is important right through the whole step of that process to ensure that when the car rolls off the line that you've got a complete car with no problems. Likewise, in quality for contact centers, though I'm not trying to say agents are cars by any way, but that interaction with the customer needs to be a quality process throughout, and it needs to kind of be integrated through all the business areas so they can be working together. So um, really important you look to see how quality can integrate across the whole business ethos than just focusing on what the agent does on customer interactions. So looking at it, so just this is the graph I showed you before. So which customer contact? So this is when we said um, majority of contact centers are evaluating interactions, um, telephone interactions, but they're only at um, less than 50% for emails and letters uh, and, and chat. So bringing it back to our cycle then, if we're failing at point one here to analyze and evaluate, how can we ensure we've got effective quality across the telephone? So point one is we evaluate the calls, evaluate the interactions, but our survey is already showing us that we're lacking on that on the email and the web chat side. So it's really critical that you are evaluating all your contact points across the whole QM process. And it would stand to reason that they obviously need to be customized. So there are different forms of communication so you would have different guidelines and different documentation for emails, letters, web chat, etc. To kind of hammer this, this process or this point home a bit more, I found some um, kind of recent data survey, and these surveys were taken less than 12 months ago. And this is what our surveys are showing us. So for example, I'm not going to read all of these, but for example, the first one there, 68% failed to actually answer questions through digital channels. That is a big concern. You know, if customers are coming into you via email or web chat, and 68% of the time they're not getting the right answers on that, that's a massive problem. That's kind of going to cause, obviously, um, customer complaints, customer issues, callbacks, etc. Another one there. Only 5% had answers that matched on three channels. To explain that a bit more, basically they contacted the contact center via, and they asked the same question via email, by letter, uh, email, telephone, and web chat. And only 5% of those contact centers actually came back with the same answer across those channels. And that's massive, so that there's this kind of disconnected information being done by the telephone and the other two. And the bottom one there, measuring quality. And this kind of just hammers what we've found in our particular survey, that there are only 91% are only measuring uh, quality on voice interactions versus 61 on non-voice. Um, so that once again, there's a disconnect. And I don't know if, um, people see email and web chat as an easier form of communication because it's a little bit more scripted or it's just text-based. I'm not 100% sure why there's this kind of disconnect between why we see it's so important to evaluate voice interactions versus um, evaluating non-voice interactions. Um, Chris, I don't know what your viewpoint on that is. I don't know if yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of things. So I think what's happened is generally the, the contact channels have, 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 have evolved quicker than the, the contact centre. So we, we're used to dealing with voice. We, we're used to having that process in place in a lot of cases. Um, and what, what tends to happen is when, when you, you set up an email function or a social media function or whatever it might be, this, in, when they originally set them up, they were outside of the, the common contact centre. And as they've then been engulfed, the, 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 the processes and the rigour that the contact centre had in place for their traditional channel um, weren't in place in the in these other departments so the, the playing catch up a little bit um, and it's a different skill set it's a different skill set it's a different process it's a different all those things that kind of thing and it, it's just playing catch up with itself I think we'll get better at it um, and I'm confident that there is the shift happening that that these things are being picked up but I think as we've grown as as, as, as businesses to, to take on these channels and as they've been moved into the customer contact center there's just been a delay in getting those things uh, up and running yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. The last thing I wanted to kind of bring back into, if you're looking at kind of developing processes and procedures or, or QM processes for these different uh, forms of uh, contacts, is when you look at your kind of guidelines, I suppose, 
I would say consider including a wow factor. And you're probably thinking, what does that actually mean? And to kind of highlight this point a little bit more, um, think about the last time you called a contact center and you got really, really bad service. So worst thing it's going to do is going to have a negative impact into your loyalty. It's frustrating, you're annoyed, you probably have to call back many times. And that negative impact to loyalty is obviously going to be, make you more inclined to churn or leave or change contracts. And of course, you're going to be inclined to tell lots of people about it. That's what we like to do. Likewise, think about the last time you called a contact centre and you had really, really good service, and the agent went well above, beyond the means of, of what was required. They wowed you. They built a good rapport. All the things that you expect from you know receiving a really good service. Naturally, of course, that has a positive impact on your loyalty. You're more likely to stay with that company. They may be more expensive, but the service is worth it. And likewise, you are more inclined to tell people when someone asks for a recommendation, you obviously have no hesitation to, to, to recommend that company you're looking at. Last one, think about when you called a contact center that you called in, you asked for something, maybe your account balance or a quick question, and the agent provided that answer, finished off the telephone call, and that was it. The, the agent was neither, neither kind of fantastic or excellent, but they weren't bad either. They, weren't, they didn't annoy you, they didn't frustrate you. And that type of interaction is, has a mutual impact on loyalty. It's not going to make you stay, but likewise, it's not going to make you leave either. You know, if someone was to offer you a better deal for a similar service, you'd probably consider it. And the last thing is, you're probably not really, really going to tell anybody it. You know, I don't tell anybody about the service I receive when I call my bank for my, my, my bank balance. You know, they did their job, that's it, it's, it's what I got. The reason why I kind of bring this, and I think most people can easily relate to this, is when you look at your quality guidelines, most quality guidelines that I see today evaluate for this, which is neutral service. They're not looking to wow the customer. And therefore, that's having, um, no impact on your customer loyalty whatsoever, or no impact on your retention. So the key thing I would say is, if you're looking at your guidelines, looking at your evaluations, or how you evaluate your calls, your guidelines should affect to evaluate for a wow service, and that is pushing the agents above and beyond. If you're only ever going to evaluate or expect your agents to provide a neutral service or a non-impact service, um, if that's when you're expecting to evaluate, then why would the agents push themselves to do more? They're not going to. You're achieving their expectations. They're probably getting 100% on their evaluation forms. The job's done. So the key thing I would say is, is that if you're looking at evaluating these multi-channels, consider this. Look to that you have an expectation that you want your agents to do more than just offer a mutual service. You want a wow service. The key thing also with this is that you need to ensure that you empower your agents to have the freedom to do it and also allow them to have the time to do it, which can be difficult because when you're looking at uh, achieving a certain handling time, um, it can be difficult to have that time to obviously uh, explore the well opportunities. And the last key point there I've done on the slide is you need to provide examples. You can't say to an agent, we want you to wow your customers and then expect them to know how to do that. It doesn't work that way. You need to look at how they can integrate, looking for these opportunities in their phone calls or in their conversations to actually make a little difference to your customers. You remember this graph here? We asked for what areas of improvement could be on QM. Um, the key one that I wanted to focus on here was um, lack of effective reporting data. This is a big one, really. So if we go back to our performance cycle, and we look at the second point there, data analysis, QM reporting is more than just about for the agent, how the agent did or how the team did. It is for the whole business, and it needs to be integrated across the business. And the key thing when I was uh, running quality departments back in my day is it was the devil wasn't the detail for me. I was keen to break those results right down by question, by section on the evaluation forms, and look at where the areas we need to improve. You know, my overall results might have been saying that the contact center was at 85%. But actually, there could have been one or two questions that were really pushing us that we could focus on to improve. Um, and then those reports really need to be distributed across the whole business area. So for example, um, we used to distribute our QM reports to the training department. And the reason we did that was when we had induction training groups coming through, when they left induction training, they'd go on the phones. After a month of evaluation, 
we would send those, those results back to the training department to see how well their training induction program did in making sure those agents were right for day one of the job. And then they could then refocus their training, maybe make improvements to it, and then we could go through that cycle again. So this is really has nothing to do about improving the agents, but improving the training process. And there are other areas in the business that can make a lot of benefit from killing reports, such as HR and recruitment, marketing departments, etc. But the important is you've got to be able to get this data out. Um, and I, I suppose if I bring you in, Marcus, now, you probably might have a viewpoint as to kind of reporting, cure and reporting side from the technology point of view. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, we can touch on that more uh, when I dive into my section. Okay, perfect. Yeah, cool. Um, last one here. Who, who received um, QM training? Do you remember this one? And we were kind of, this is the graph that I was saying I was most alarmed about, low training. So once again, on our, on our performance cycle, we come down to the third point now, coach and business improvement. You need to train everyone on the QM process. It needs to be integrated into the whole process. So that's really critical. Once again, um, back in the days when I used to run quality departments, we would give, as a bare minimum, a half a day training session just on QM for every agent coming through the induction process. And we would focus on you know, what was expected of them, what could they expect from the QM department, what could they expect from their managers, how they would be evaluated, what reports they would get, how they would be coached and developed. We would do things um, like listen to calls and get them to evaluate calls. And it's about buying them into that process and getting them into that commitment. On top of that, we would have training courses for team leaders, for managers, on how to be effective coaches, how to evaluate effectively. And a really important one, how to use the software. Um, that was a critical thing. And I've been to so many contact centers where they've had QM software maybe after two or three years. You go back into that contact center and you realize half the people that were originally trained aren't there anymore. They've moved on to bigger and better things. And there's a lack of knowledge about how to effectively use that tool, how to effectively pull reports out of that tool, or how to evaluate use the, even the basics of evaluation. So it's really important to have a continual training program cycle on even how to use the tools for QM to make sure everyone is up to date and knows um, how to effectively use it. Um, I don't know if Marcus or Chris, either of you want to focus on have a discussion about training or, or training expectations. I think you're right. I think there's a bit that we have to make sure that the alignment's there. So there has to be, uh, it has to fit into the process. So what is the purpose of the output? And go back to your previous slide as well in terms of the reporting and having that 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 kind of, that whole bit of going, all this sits together. So if we're looking at it as a strategic business decision, you know, in terms of our business strategy, if we're looking at it around people development, are we focusing on compliance, whatever those things might be, it all needs to sit in. We need to be able to provide the data and the information that tells us that we're doing the right stuff um, or where we need to improve and then we need to be able to have the training in place to rectify any anomalies within our within our performance and they've got to work together um, and then be aligned back to wherever we need it to be it's just it, it just it's common sense but we just it, we, it, the, the, the issue we have is that the outcome or the, the purpose of our QM process isn't defined enough at the beginning. So we just create information or reporting that's for that for that group of people or that individual rather than looking at the bigger picture and going, actually, as a business, where are we failing? Where do we need to improve? Who needs to see that information and what training and development do we need in place to ensure we move in the right direction? Definitely. Yes, exactly. And, and like, you, like you were just saying there, you know, it is a simple process. And so you're know, bringing it back to this process now. This is a simple process. It's not a difficult thing to do. But to make it work well, it needs to have all these elements in place to, to, to look at it, um, to, to make it effective within your business. So like um, Chris was mentioning, you need, you need to have processes, you need to have documentation, you need to have the right training in there, the right reporting, etc. And all these things fit together to make it an effective process. And if one of them aren't done correctly or falling down or lacking, then the process will start to fall apart. Um, and it's really important. As you can see from the results that we're getting from the survey, there are still easy and simple improvements that any contact center can do to actually make this process so much more effective. 
you know, this kind of presentation is not about, uh, I suppose, trying to pitch like the, the latest and greatest new process or new new system. It's about just saying, look, if you look at what's within your organisation today, you can probably easily see there could be simple things that changes that you could make that would make a big difference to your business and and quality monitoring process. You know, a simple thing like introducing a training program or maybe better defining the process of the documentation. Just make things clearer and can make this process work a lot better. Right, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, my presentation. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. And I'll hand back to Joe. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, we are going to pass it on to Marcus. Um, we'll just put your slides up now. Okay, let me see when you, let me know when you can all see the slides. So yeah, Marcus, we can see your slides now. Okay, great. Okay, so to to try and um, give a perspective from the 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 vendor side. So as a as a technology vendor, we spend a lot of time um, talking to our customers, um, reading through the types of uh, surveys and reports um, that we uh, that we've just been taken through, Sorry, understand sure. where the market is going and what our customers. Marcus, could you make your screens full screen? It um, oh, it is full screen. We're seeing your presenter notes, Mark, as opposed to the um, the slideshow. Yeah. Okay. So then I need to. Okay, one second. That should be better. Okay, let's see. No. Uh, we're not seeing them yet. Hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one second. Let me try that again. And now. Uh, we can't see them yet, but if you click on the side, there is a little icon showing your screen. Ah, uh, there you go. Perfect. Well done. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, lesson learned about having uh, two screens active at the same time when doing a presentation. Okay. Um, so the, the 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 focus is, is always to try and drive improvements, <clears throat> and what we've found is that often the, the technology um, outstrips the uh, the use. In other words, uh, a lot of what we've seen in the survey around, on the one hand, um, customers are saying that the software, uh, the QM software, can is effective but can be improved. Um, we we see that very often that uh, a lot of the customers. Um, are using the software but not using the full capabilities of the software and that uh, often there is a lack of knowledge and experience around the applications themselves so on the one hand we're developing more and more sophisticated uh, applications and on the other hand there's a gap a growing gap between those the, the, the technology and the functionality <coughs> and the sophistication of those tools and our uh, ability to actually use them implement them and maintain a level of knowledge necessary to be able to use them effectively. So that's always a, a balance, and uh, we find more and more that um, the, the requirement for the applications training and that refresher training uh, becomes greater and greater. So um, again, there there is a lot of functionality within the technology that we see isn't being used, uh, and yet we still get continuous demands from uh, our customers and from our businesses to provide more and more functionality. So what we're going to see today is um, that attempt um, by NICE to provide that additional uh, functionality that we're seeing that we have uh, reflected in the uh, in the survey. 
Okay, so from um, the research that we have done, a lot of the capabilities that we see focus around this idea of um, what challenges are driving uh, the business. One of the big ones uh, that we see uh, currently is this idea of a quality tool that will be able to drive both the front office and the back office. In other words, our customers want to be able to do evaluations across the organization, not just on a phone call, but also on any type of front office communication, whether it be through email, chat, uh, and so on, and also across the back office as well. Am I able to evaluate a process? Am I able to evaluate, for example, for an insurance provider, a claims process that may have stretched out over several weeks? Um, and do we have the capabilities to broaden the scope of what we're evaluating? Uh, improving performance, this is always a, a big one. Am I able to deliver through my quality program a holistic view of performance? Okay, or am I focused only on that one area, such as um, agent performance on uh, a phone call? Okay, or can I broaden that if I have enough data, if I'm feeding in the right information into the system, to broaden that, as an example, into the back office or into processes, for example? Can my quality program highlight certain processes that are broken uh, within the organization that are improved can drive additional agent performance, uh, customer experience, lower customer effort, and so on. Um, maximizing resources. Uh, what can I do to automate processes, to reduce the amount of effort on the agent side or on the QA team side so that we get more value from the resources that we have? Okay, it's uh, not often that our organizations um, are increasing the size of uh, the, the number of people in my quality team. So we need to make uh, the most value from the resources we have. So if that's, for example, automated selection of calls or evaluate for evaluation, or if it's the ability to um, uh, streamline the evaluation process, to put that in a workflow uh, that is carried out all online, that it's uh, seamless, that there's no need for use of multiple systems, and so on and so forth. So Again, a very big part of the, uh, the technology push is the ability to automate as much as possible the quality process, even down to the level of automatically answering questions. Okay. Is it possible to answer questions in an evaluation form um, automatically to have a, uh, an intelligent system do that for us? Um, operational efficiency, again, uh, that idea of uh, the automation and the customization of uh, the system. Uh, a lot of the feedback we get around uh, what uh, organizations need to see more of is that can the tool be customized to fit my organization, the way that we work, our business processes, our business needs, okay? And through that, to drive additional efficiencies um, through a closer alignment to my business goals, my operational needs, and the uh, technology itself. So customization and tailoring become very, very important. Um, and, of course, engaging employees. Uh, we see uh, a lot of instances where quality tends to be a process that is done to the agent as opposed to something that is done with the agent. Um, and there is more of a move, especially with uh, the, uh, the workforce um, moving into the millennials, that people need to be engaged. So can we provide that technology um, background to the applications to engage our agents further? Do we have a self-evaluation process? Do we have um, the ability to support agent calibration uh, within the, the call evaluation process? Or is that something, again, that only the evaluators can do? Are we able to provide agents with good visibility of their performance, their results? Are they able to listen to their own calls, see their own evaluation forms? Do we have a, an online system where we can coach them effectively using the right calls and the right evaluation to drive home the message of that, uh, that coaching? Do they have dashboards, reports that are effective and focused at an agent level? All of that information, all of that inclusion that drives uh, an engaged employee workforce. So the, uh, the, the core capabilities, having taken that into account, the, uh, the core capabilities that uh, NICE has been pushing towards, 
um, has been first and foremost to completely change the underlying technology um, that we use and that we see as being used across, uh, across the system. So, for example, um, in the past, our, our quality platform was tied to our recording platforms. In other words, if you wanted to use nice quality, you would have to have nice recording. So our current version of, uh, of quality is detached from recording. And this has opened up all sorts of possibilities because it allows us to build a platform that's much more flexible um, and is much more easy to adapt and change and tailor to our uh, customers' needs when that platform is not locked into the recording environment. And it also means that we can, in fact, um, evaluate on top of any other recording environment or any other environment at all. In other words, it doesn't have to be phone calls. It can be back office. It can be email chat. It can basically be anything. So um, the, the, that open structure has allowed us to very effectively sit on top of any of those types of information and data that we want to feed into our quality process and use as part of the quality process. Okay, the, uh, the key focus for us um, has always been uh, interaction selection. How do we get to the right interaction, okay, whether that be a call or an email or chat, that we want to evaluate? Are we able to automatically select them and to feed those interactions into the quality process? The building of forms, the uh, use of our coaching workflows to action uh, the information that's coming off our evaluations, and of course the dashboards and reports to support that. So again, the, the movement to a more open uh, application has enabled us to build into uh, our latest version of our quality tools, a BI tool. So uh, as we saw, uh, reporting, limited uh, reporting and data uh, it was probably one of the key issues in areas for improvement within the other uh, report. And this is a piece of work that we've been focused on very heavily. And uh, this year we've released um, a, a tool that is, if you like, a, it's a fully functional BI tool that allows you to build reports um, as, as you wish, tailor those reports, basically allowing you to feed any data you want into your quality system and use that as part of your uh, reporting and uh, um, also to correlate between the, uh, the quality data that you're getting from your evaluation form and any other data that you have from your uh, environment. Okay, so for example, if we have an analytics tool to feed that into quality. If we have a voice of the customer, customer feedback tool to feed that into quality. Um, if you have other uh, CRM, okay, customer relations management type data, and the age of the customer, uh, if the customer is male or female, where the customer lives um, in the country, how long the customer has been a customer of your particular organization. The ability to be able to feed all of that type of data into your quality program and then to be able to slice and dice the results of your quality program down to the question level with that information. Or on the other hand, to be able to push evaluations okay, by a particular customer type okay, or customer age or whatever it might be. So this uh, integration of additional data and the ability to be able to report on that and visualize that, visualization tools, um, has been a very big push for us um, over the past couple of years. And uh, our latest version has that built in to the system. OK, um, automate and customize. And one of the biggest pieces for us is that simplification of uh, the technology to be able to get the maximum value that we can from the investment that we're making in our quality processes. So um, evaluating multi-skilled agents, um, multiple interactions per form. So for example, um, I want to evaluate uh, cross-channel. Okay, we saw in the, uh, the first survey results that our customers are interacting with us on more than one channel. It's not just phone calls anymore. It could be chat, it could be email, and so on. Am I able to evaluate a customer's journey or a customer's experience across multiple channels. Okay, so, uh, up until now, NICE was focused very much, as it was the market, only on phone calls. We now have the ability to evaluate across channels. So I can take an evaluation and I can add into a single evaluation multiple interactions. So let's uh, um, an example. Um, I have a, um, a claims process where the customer called three times, they sent two emails, and they had several chat sessions. We can wrap all of that into a single evaluation 
and evaluate the customer's end-to-end -end experience uh, of my contact center, okay, and the support, uh, assistance, and so on that they got. That ability to be able to integrate multiple pieces of data into a single unit, and if you like, to have a case. Okay, so I'm evaluating a case as opposed to a specific interaction. This gives us much more insight and a lot more uh, effective um, feedback about the customer's experience and our agent, and not just the agent, but the entire process uh, ability to um, support that agent, I'm sorry, support that customer's needs. Again, uh, um, technology to drive uh, more control, uh, automation of these processes, automation of call selection, uh, alignment to schedules, um, the ability, for example, to be able to, from within the evaluation form, um, set up the coaching session and to have that coaching session um, link back to your workforce management uh, tool so that it would be automatically set up for the agent and for the team leader at a specified time and that all this can be managed online uh, in real time. That sort of level of automation to um, improve processes and improve efficiencies. Um, guidance, again, that, that ability to be able to make the process as simple as possible and provide within the evaluation form additional hints or tips um, for the evaluator to be able to most effectively uh, evaluate. And the idea of auto answer. So um, within uh, the latest version of NICE evaluation forms, <coughs> we have the ability to have the system, again, depending on the type of data you have being driven into the tool, to automatically answer some of those questions. Um, from our uh, from our surveys, we can see that approximately um, 25 to 30 percent of most questions in an evaluation form can be automated. In other words, can be automatically answered. And those are questions that would typically um, be data-driven. So, for example, if one of the questions in your evaluation form is, um, did the call end in a transfer, that data about whether or not the call was transferred is classic CTI data that we can pull from the CTI server feed into the evaluation and be able to tick as, yes, that call ended in a, uh, in a transfer. Okay, another example would be data that we're pulling off a uh, CRM system about the customer. Okay, if there's a specific piece of customer, a specific piece of data about the customer, what service um, they have uh, from my organization or what status they are within the organization. Are they a gold customer, a silver, or a bronze customer? Um, that data, if that's a question in the evaluation form, we can pull the data from the CRM system and automatically answer that question. And uh, the, probably one of the, uh, the key uh, advantages would be if we have an analytics tool and we want to answer questions according to what was said in the conversation. Okay, so I want to be able to check um, the, the, the agent said A, B, or C. In other words, did they comply to specific compliance regulations? Was that said by the agent? And we can tick yes for a specific question within the evaluation form. So that uh, automation of answering uh, is a very powerful tool and certainly a type of technology that we are uh, uh, developing and working towards to be able to evaluate uh, more and more effectively. So just a, a high-level screenshot of what uh, the, uh, the applications look like and the type of uh, evaluation forms that we can see. So um, within the system, uh, we can see that the evaluation form is broken down into different sections. When you highlight a specific section, that comes up on the form. And then, of course, you have your typical questions uh, with all of the different types of answer, uh, uh, different types of answers that we can use to free text and the uh, interaction built into the evaluation form itself so that it can be played back from within the evaluation, and of course, if we were to add multiple um, interactions into the evaluation, you would see them all, uh, all added up here. Uh, the, other piece, the other piece of technology that we're working on at the moment is the idea of routing within an evaluation form. So if, for example, we have a particular question, and the, depending on the answer, you can either open or close additional questions or sections within the evaluation. Okay, so for example, you have an evaluation. If we have a, a gold customer, you would like a different type of question or a different section that would open than if the customer was only a bronze level customer. 
okay? Or if the customer had a particular product, you would like a different set of questions to open than a customer with a different product. And all of that can now be uh, managed within the evaluation form, and when you're building the form, you can build a specific type of routing within the form, again, to be able to simplify and uh, increase efficiencies within the evaluation process and within the forms themselves. Um, also built into the evaluation is this idea of uh, self-evaluation, where we can send a, an evaluation directly to an agent uh, in an automated fashion so that the agent can evaluate the same call that the team leader or that the QA evaluated, and then they can sit side by side and they can compare evaluations. Okay, um, and that also is uh, as part of uh, an integrated coaching uh, process, agent self-evaluation can be an extremely um, uh, valuable and effective tool. Okay, um, <coughs> automated customize, customization of coaching, um, targeted coaching, again the idea of being able to integrate between all these different elements and that from directly within the evaluation form we're able to generate coaching and that the right evaluation is sent with the right call for evaluation. And um, the coaching forms of course can be customized so that if you have a particular coaching methodology you will be able to build that into the, evaluate, into the, into the coaching form itself. Let's say for example you are using the GROW model uh, for your coaching methodology, then you'll be able to build a GROW model coaching form so that you will have a standardized, standardized coaching practice uh, across your organization. And uh, just a quick uh, look at what a dashboard might look like. So for example here we can see a particular agent, this is Charles, and we can see say a particular metric, this would be long average handle time calls, and we can highlight where a coaching event took place, that would be the line down the side here, to be able to track whether or not the coaching itself has been effective, okay, whether or not the coaching itself has um, aided the agent in being able to reduce their long average handle time calls, or whatever particular metric or KPI that you're currently tracking or is important to your business. I'm just wary of the time, because we wanted to leave some time for questions, so I'll just cover uh, one more uh, piece and then I'll send it back to the floor for, uh, for questions. Um, that piece is, is automation of workflows. Possibly the, the strongest piece of development that's been done on the technology side um, is around uh, automation and the ability to be able to build your own workflows. So we have within the tool something that looks like this. If you've ever used a video, it uh, looks very, very similar where you have a particular workflow and you want to be able to build step by step what happens in that workflow. The uh, technology works exactly the same way except that what you are building is in fact rules. You're telling the system what to do in case A, B or C. So the most simplest uh, example would be send um, three calls per agent uh, per month um, and all of those calls have to be um, long handle time calls and then we would build that in a workflow and the system would from that point forward automatically send those calls to the correct uh, assessor at the, at a specified time and of course it would send the right calls depending on uh, that selection. Um, we can also build into these workflows a lot more complex types of, uh, of uh, workflows. Uh, we have a customer for example where the phone call cannot be evaluated if it is older than 24 hours. So within this loop, we can build an additional workflow that will tell the system um, if the call hits 24 hours uh, from the time that it was uh, recorded, then you need to swap that call out and bring in a fresh call. So the idea of uh, automation and the building of workflows to, uh, that can be applied to lots of different uh, processes, not just evaluation, but also coaching, calibration, um, performance reviews, and so on and so forth. Okay, I think that I'll hand it back um, uh, to you and uh, we can open the floor for questions. Great, thank you so much Marcus. Guys, um, I'll have quite a couple of questions now um, here. Can you, we're just going to put them up really quickly. Here you go. So, 
Uh, do you feel that the monitoring should just be down to the team leader or should it be handled by the compliance team? Also, I think with this one, it goes very well with Kieran's question of what will be some of the challenges with QA moving from TMs to the dedicated uh, QA in your opinions? I think Brent and Chris, you guys probably um, could answer this question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, Brent. Do you want to go first? I'll uh, I'll chip in. Okay. No. Worries. Um, well, I suppose based on my experience and my my feelings of it, I always feel that quality monitoring is best set within a dedicated QM team. Um, you know, it can be a non-biased opinion first of all. It can be a team that's focused purely on their skill to be able to listen and interpret the, the calls and then document uh, document those evaluations back. I would normally split it though that the, the QM team would be responsible for evaluating the calls and then that would be fed back to the, the, to the team leader or the team manager who would then is responsible for coaching and developing. You know, the, the, the team manager's role is quite a multi-skilled role. It does have to deal with lots of different issues throughout the day. And taking their time away to sit and listen to calls is very difficult and you start to get, I suppose, a lack of consistency across, across the board with a lot of team leaders. So it's better to take that function away and have a dedicated team. And a smaller team of QM people can evaluate more calls than a larger pool of team leaders just with the sheer responsibilities of their role. Um, in saying that, though, you need to have very clear processes in terms of how those QM specialists um, document those evaluations because you're relying upon the QM person to document the evaluation form. Send that to the team leader. The team leader needs to interpret what you, that QM person has said and how that, um, you know, what they saw in that particular conversation or that interaction, and then be able to effectively feed that back to the to the agent themselves and coach the agent. So they need to be very clear on how they document their evaluations, how they evaluate their evaluations. But I always feel it's better to keep it within a QM team um, in that side, and they can also focus then heavily on doing a lot of dedicated QM reporting, which they can then feed out to the business. And when I used to run QM teams, the thing we used to ask is, is, you know, how does QM add value to the business? And they can, as a QM department, you can add a lot of value to a lot of different areas. I feel Chris trying to jump in there. Um, what, do you, what do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, I'm conscious of time. So I think there is a, you know, there, 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 there's merits to a dedicated resource looking after it, A for consistency and A for, for continuity. And I think then there's a bit that says, if you have the right process in place in terms of what are you trying to drive what is the outcome and who gets that information you can then work on the development areas you know quality monitoring is 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 essentially looking at your, your your advisors around how they are dealing with your customers and how they are adhering to processes within the business a team manager has to do that do that listening and that investigatory piece of it they, they just need to act on the information that's available to them in terms of this is where we need to improve this is where I can develop people this is which processes my team are struggling with etc etc so I think there's you know th their time is best served developing people rather than generating data to develop people that should be somebody else's role Okay, great, great. Thanks, guys. So the next question is, how can you ensure technology deployment continues to deliver results in the long run? Uh, Brent and Marcus, I think you guys could take this one over. I'll let Marcus jump in. <laughs> Marcus, you still with us? <laughs> Yeah, yes, sorry, I was um, I was very effectively talking to myself on mute. So, <laughs> the from my experience, the um, the, the, it all begins with having very very clear goals about what you're trying to do. Okay, so why are we implementing technology? Okay, what are we expected to do? What are the expected uh, success factors? Okay, and we this is the, the the language that we use in in Nice. What are the success criteria for this particular deployment? Okay, and then we build the, the deployment, the, uh, the adoption, the embedding, all of those um, business ready, readiness type of aspects around delivering on those goals. So as long as the organization has very, very clear goals about what it is that they are going to achieve from the technology, then we can make sure that we are continuously aligned to deliver results. Okay, and that should, of course, be updated on a uh, quarterly basis. 
Okay, this is the, the way that we work, the way that we uh, integrate at the business level. Again, one of the uh, survey results uh, that came back was around how much of the quality program is, is aligned to business strategy. Um, and it's always our push, it's always our practice that the quality program be as closely aligned and tied into um, business process and business outcomes. And when it is, you then have your marker. Okay, is the technology that's deployed allowing me to hit my business goals? If not, what do I need? Uh, if it is, that's great. How do we improve on that? How do we continue to do that? And that cycle can be done on a quarterly basis as most organizations' business structure runs and is refreshed on a quarterly basis. And this is exactly what we do when we deploy. We, uh, we understand what the customer's uh, goals are for the year, how they've broken that down into quarters, and then we have the same goals uh, and the same structure, if you like the uh, governance structure, for the, uh, the deployment of the technology. And this is how we align and make sure that the technology is closely delivering on results from uh, quarter to quarter. Great. Thank you so much, Marcus, for answering that. Um, our next question is, how do you get all the people who do quality monitoring aligned? And you guys talked about training, but is there a good process to set up um, this in an ongoing way. Um, perhaps maybe Chris? Yeah, it's an ongoing debate. So calibration is um, is typical. So in, ensuring you have that regular touch point um, and have those have that process aligned within your business in terms of what are we looking to do, um, what are we doing, and it all starts essentially from your evaluation process. So how easy is your evaluation process to understand? How subjective is it, or how subjective isn't it? Um, that'll 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 enable a easier degree and um, the one thing I always talk to people about around calibration is essentially forget about what you're saying yes or no to if that's the way your 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 kind of evaluation process set up but have a real common agreement around what is the outcome what is the outcome that the customer expects and deserves based on their contact into your business and has the advisor done that um, or has the agent done that and, and, and fulfilled that obligation to the customer? And if you focus more on that side of things rather than have you tick the right boxes, is this a yes, is that a no, actually your alignment becomes becomes easier to get to. You focus on the outcome for the customer, you focus on the right outcome for the business uh, and make sure the process are being followed. It becomes such an easier process. Um, but it, 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 that needs to be built in, it needs to be built in your process, have regular catch-ups, have, have, have a forum where people can do that um, regular and, and, and very open discussion um, around what, what good looks like as a business. Okay, uh, Brent, do you have anything um, you want to add to this? Um, the other thing I'd, I'd add is, is that um, one of the things that we used to do um, when I was running Quality was do something called agent synergy sessions where we would get a group of agents into a meeting room together to listen to call and just share best practice, discuss, you know, you'd get kind of agents, some agents are good at one thing but not good at others. And it's just the fact of listening to calls together, discussing the quality of those calls, and it can be a very informal process, but it's a good way of just sharing best practice across a group of individuals. Um, to, to see you know, good and bad ways of doing things on, uh, through their phone calls. So that's a big advocator. I have that. Is Agent synergy Sessions is a good way of just bringing people together and just talking about what is good and what makes a really good call. Okay, great. Um, I think this is going to be our final question. Um, and are the benefits of quality monitoring software limited if there is no holistic CRM to tap into? Or can it justify the cost linked to call recording alone? Brent, Marcus. Okay, I think I'll jump into yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll jump into uh, to answer that one. Um, okay, justifying costs is a big one. Uh, are we able to uh, to align you know a particular ROI, our return on investment in the software? That's a whole other issue, and uh, happy to do a whole other webinar just on that. But let's try and tackle the first part of the question. Okay, the benefits of QM software limited if I don't have a holistic CRM. The answer is most definitely yes. Any um, functional online QM software will be a major step forward and a huge uh, advantage if what you're currently doing today is offline or manual um, or you're using some sort of homegrown system based on Excel and so on. Okay, as an example, I'm uh, working currently with a, a customer in Turkey. Um, and we have automated their QM process. Now, this is an organization that does not have 
um, a, a CRM, um, a holistic CRM view, and they don't have a QM team. The team leaders are doing the evaluations. Um, but even just that basic uh, integration of QM software that is now online and where everything is managed in one environment, we have saved um, the team leaders uh, on average six to eight hours per team leader per week. And that's just savings in terms of time that they were spending looking for the right call to evaluate. Okay, so we've automated call selection for evaluation. We've automated the evaluation process it itself by providing them the right evaluation forms that are all online. All of the reporting that they had to spend several hours a week doing is now being done automatically in the system. So we take a step back. This is an organization with 120 team leaders. Okay, how much time is that? Okay, let's take six hours per team leader per week. You extrapolate that into a month, you extrapolate that into a year, and we have tens of thousands of hours, man hours, that can now be fed into other activities. Okay, and of course, they're feeding that activity back into additional training or additional coaching for their agents. So instead of one coaching session per month, they've now upped that to two coaching sessions per month and leading from the field, in other words, um, spending more time with their agents actually in the trenches doing the team leader role as opposed to spending time doing reporting or doing um, you know, manual tasks such as finding calls. So even something as simple as that without a CRM system can provide tremendous uh, benefits and efficiencies for your quality process. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, I think this is, we don't really have any more time um, for more questions, but for those who have asked questions and we haven't been able to answer today, we are going to be getting back to you via email, um, so don't worry. And in terms of the recording, you're going to get a link to the recording and a link to uh, the slides as well. I think by the end of the week or early next week latest. But guys, thank you so much to Brent, Chris, and Marcus for putting together this presentation. It was really helpful. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.